Flannery's as mad as a cut snake. Don't you give him a fucking sniff. Don't worry, mate. He'll be looking at these brains before he knows what's happened. It's got a nice weight, doesn't it? I let it rip last night. Fire straight as an arrow. I'm glad you approve. It's a beautiful piece of work. No wonder Flannery wants to get his hands on it. Listen, just you remember, this is my home. For Christ's sake, don't go spraying bullets all over the bloody place. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, Stan. This is still fucking ridicule, right? Thanks, George. Just don't keep me waiting in that bloody cupboard. You know I don't like confined spaces. You make sure you come out blasting. Don't worry, mate. He won't know what hit him. It's just a few miss, mate. He'll be reaching for whatever he's got in that bloody little man bag of his, and I'm betting it's not a fucking hanky. You sure you don't want to drink? No, no, no. I'll tell you what, you're going to love this shooter. Yeah, well, I better. You've been going on about it long enough. Well, can I see it? They make them in Israel. Fires 1,200 rounds a minute. Well, this is your ass, mate. You're going to be fucking invincible. And we'll settle back and live like kings. Well, you don't look like you're doing too bad, George. <laughs> so where the fuck is it? It's just in the other room. I'll grab it. Nice gun. Meet Stan the Man Smith, feared enforcer, cold-hearted assassin, drug trafficker and murderer turned man of God. Tonight, we take a look at the facts behind the fiction of the life of Stanley John Smith, the enforcer. A feared extortionist and executioner, Smith's gang ruled Sydney's underworld for over 30 years. He courted the mafia, imported vast quantities of drugs, and was linked to over a dozen underworld murders. Tonight, experts speak openly for the first time about one of Australia's most prolific killers. Through expert analysis and dramatised scenes, we'll examine the life of an assassin who found God. Stan Smith was a very effective executioner. G'day, Chris. He was a man that if you walked in the pub where you were having a drink during the 70s and 80s, you'd run out, you wouldn't walk out. By all accounts, uh, he was possibly one of Australia's, if not the, most successful hitman we've ever had. No! Quite a number of murders were attributed to him, but no one could prove anything. You'll find that he's doing it from the shadows. Police have him down for as many as 25 shooting incidents and as many as 15 murders. No other criminal that was as smart as he was. He was one of the big time crims. Smith was involved in crime nearly all of his life. Although he dressed like a businessman in sharp suits, underneath the polished exterior was a vicious and violent criminal who killed multiple times. Growing up in post-war Sydney, Smith faced a life of dead-end jobs on the docks until a chance friendship with notorious criminal Lenny McPherson changed everything. McPherson became Smith's mentor, introducing him to the world of organised crime. Together with Sydney hard man George Freeman, they formed The Team, a vicious gang which dominated Sydney's underworld for over three decades. Stan Smith had a roller coaster life in, in crime. Basically, he went from enforcer, gunman, murderer, to organiser, planner, architect of a major drug distribution ring. Stan Smith was so far behind the scenes it wasn't funny. He was a person who kept to himself, kept out of the limelight, didn't publicly associate with other crooks. Some of the figures that were run by me indicated that he made uh, many millions of dollars uh, as a consequence of uh, drug dealing. Stan was regarded as something of the brains. Can I tell you, I had access to phone taps very early in the piece. Stan would talk to Lenny McPherson and George Freeman sometimes up to six and ten times a day. And he would talk to them in terms about what they were doing or shouldn't be doing like a broker would be talking to some big-time investor. 
The team ruthlessly expanded and protected their empire, and anyone who threatened their interests was rapidly dispatched. And as Melbourne gangster Chris Flannery discovered, taking on the team was a deadly mistake. Chris Flannery was a Melbourne criminal who had a history of violence down there, had killed a number of people. Flannery had come um, from the, the disorder of Melbourne, where the police didn't run the crims. He wasn't part of a, a sort of a, a machine, if you like. Sydney was a machine. It was run with very specific guidelines. Um, you know, you had to work within those or you didn't work at all. Freeman took him under his, under his wing, whether it was to use him as muscle or to keep an eye on an absolute psychotic loose cannon or, or a combination of both. George Freeman gave him a job. Now, someone told me he was getting paying him six or seven hundred bucks a week, which back in those days wasn't bad dough for doing nothing. All he had to do was behave himself. But, of course, Flannery was forever getting around, you know, uh, offering his services to kill people. Flannery wanted to, in effect, replace Freeman. That's the kingpin. Uh, to that extent, he became a problem. Flannery, dubbed rent kill was a heartless gun for hire who'd kill anyone for $50,000, even his friends. Reckless and arrogant, Flannery became a marked man after shooting serving policeman Michael Drury in his family home. Against the odds, Drury survived. It was a crime that shocked Australia. This was a type of crime that was beyond the acceptable behaviour of people like Lanny McPherson and George Freeman, the old-style organised crime figure. They would only interfere with other violent criminals. That was the nature of their criminality. This was a whole new level again. You don't go pulling your gun out, you don't go shooting the place up, you don't go shooting at, um, at pedestrians, you don't go shooting at, at, at do it, people standing in the, in, the, in the bank, you don't go shooting at coppers. Shooting a policeman uh, is always bad for business and it, 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 it uh, raises the spectre of other um, relationships being exposed, other uh, after effects. And so um, at the end of the day, I think George Freeman, Lenny McPherson, uh, Stan Smith and others couldn't take the risk on this guy. Flannery's disappearance has never been officially solved, but now for the first time, our sources go on the record to name the man they believe killed him and give the details of his execution. My own view is, uh, is that Flannery uh, was executed by Stan Smith at the behest of George Freeman. Flannery's as mad as a cut snake. Don't you give him a fucking sniff. Don't worry, mate. He'll be looking at these brains before he knows what's happened. I've never had any doubt that Flannery was uh, disposed of by George Freeman in concert with Stan the Man Smith. Freeman and Flannery used to regularly share a sauna bath or a steam. And during one of the conversations one day, Freeman is alleged to have said to Flannery, look, I've got a pretty good machine pistol if you want it. Um, I'll, I'll get it for you. Basically, he agreed to meet George Freeman at Freeman's house, and he was at last going to get this machine pistol. I'll tell you what, you're going to love this shooter. Yeah, well, I better. You've been going on about it long enough. Well, can I see it? He walked into to a closet where he expected the gun to be, where Freeman told him the gun was, and he opened that closet door, and out came Stan Smith with the machine pistol in hand, and Chris Flannery was shot dead there and then. Good day, Chris. So in other words, you had the perfect setting where you had this psychotic gunman who would normally not go within 300 yards of anyone with a gun, went into the house expecting to see a gun, expecting it to be handed to him, but of course it was handed to him all right, but the wrong way around, front first, and then the body was disposed of. If someone got in the way, they'd simply have to be removed. Clinical? Absolutely. Did it make perfect sense? Absolutely. Was Flurry going to be missed? Not by many. Born in 1936, Stan the Man Smith was raised in poverty in the tough working class suburb of Balmain. Leaving school at 13, Smith drifted in and out of work on the docks, a place where no one cared about his rapidly growing criminal record. 
Times were hard, and for boys like Smith, a life of crime offered just about the only passage to a better life. Smith's teenage years were also marked by stints at two of Australia's toughest reformatories, Gosford and Tamworth, both renowned for their hellish regimes. One of the side effects of putting teenagers into prisons or prison-like institutions is that they model, they copy all of that bad stuff. At a very early age, violence becomes normalised. It becomes the way of life. There isn't any other way of uh, working out how to respond to someone except by being violent. That kind of thing at that early age leaves an indelible mark. It becomes extremely difficult to escape that kind of worldview. After a childhood scarred by poverty and crime, Smith turned 18 without any direction in his life. But two events happened that year which would change everything. Smith met and formed a strong friendship with local hard man Lenny McPherson, and he married his childhood sweetheart, Marilyn. I believe in the early days there would have been the mentor, father type figure of Lenny McPherson and young Stan Smith. I guess McPherson would have seen a lot in Smith that he'd saw in himself as well, because McPherson also had a very substantial record. They both saw themselves as Balmain boys who did it tough. 16 years older than Smith, McPherson had also survived Gosford and Tamworth reformatories. Maybe seeking a kindred spirit, McPherson quickly took Smith under his wing. Well, we didn't have the mentorship from McPherson. He probably would have been continuing on that pathway of working on the docks, being a Balmain boy, being a bit of a toughie, being a bit of a smart ass, being a bit of a larrikin. But at some point, he's successfully, <laughs> in criminal circles, moved away and found another pathway. I think that the, the, the leaders in crime look for youth who they can groom, but who also have that essence of detachment to other people. Someone who's got a ruthless kind of aspect to them. McPherson was in the business of acquiring people who could be of use to him to establish his own empire. And he saw, that, saw in Stan Smith someone who could help him get to the top. Smith had turned 18 with no clear future. Now, less than a year later, he was getting married and he found himself a mentor who would change the course of his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you too. Oh. Try the good stuff. <laughs> Mind if I do? Thanks. Lovely, Stan. Lovely wedding. And doesn't the little missus look beautiful? She does. Oh. Yeah, she does. Thanks, Mr McPherson. You don't look too bad yourself. Oh. Did you hear that? <laughs> you better keep an eye on her, son. What's the plan, <laughs> Mr McPherson? Len. Uh, righto. Len. Mm. Len it is, then. Len it is. Now? Actually, I'm just starting to enjoy being called Mrs Smith. Thanks, Len. <laughs> you gents excuse me for a minute? Of course, Mrs Smith. Uh, thanks for the plonk and the food, by the way. Oh, it's the least I can do for a mate on his special day. Mm. Where'd you get the suit, by the way? Hide it from Gowings. Mm. Not bad. Yeah, it's a bit tight around the arms. So now you're married, what are you going to do for work? Well, I'm going pretty well down at the wharf. Mm -hmm. Up for a promotion next year. Planning on having some kids? Yeah, of course. You want them to have the same upbringing you had? What are you asking, Len? Well, I need some help, young Stan, and I think you might be able to give it to me. Go on. Well, there are some businesses around town that need me to look after their interests in terms of competition. I know what protection is. Well, there you go. I'm too busy to go around and see everybody as regularly as I'd like to. And I need someone trustworthy to attend to their needs. But what about my job? You've got a new job, Stan. And I promise you'll never have to wear a rented suit again. Stan Smith married Marilyn. They were both 18 years of age and they remained married throughout their lives. He was prepared to do the crime, the hard work, in order to advance his family. He remained involved in a loving relationship with his wife for his entire life, kept his children away from a life of crime, 
but he was prepared to get his hands dirty to set that situation up. Smith's wedding day cemented the two most significant relationships in his life. His marriage to Marilyn lasted for 54 years, and his friendship with McPherson would only be ended by death. When Smith and McPherson got together in Sydney, it was an invitation to mayhem. They just took total control. Two men with similar personalities, all of them brutal, um, savage, unrelenting uh, and possessed of uh, a need to be totally on top of things and eradicate totally anybody who got in their way. Smith and McPherson were inseparable and when they joined forces with George Freeman, an old jail buddy of McPherson's, they became unstoppable. They really became, if you like, the three musketeers. There was a division of labour. You had the father figure, the organiser in McPherson. You had the gamer, the better. Uh, the casino operator in uh, George Freeman, and you had Smith as the godfather of drug dealing and dealing with anyone that got out of line. There was McPherson who did the communication skills, who could be both violent as well as charming, and we had Stan, who was basically the end of the train, the caboose, who was the stick that was wielded. Should Freeman and McPherson not be persuasive, then Stan would have been very persuasive. One of the team's earliest rackets involved extorting money from illegal brothels. Despite being newly married, Smith was openly promiscuous and extremely violent towards women who rejected his advances. He was also alleged to have raped two teenage girls with his partner in crime, Lenny McPherson. While Stan was married to his wife for a lifetime, um, he was known to be extremely violent towards other women, particularly prostitutes, Stan was used by those who ran the brothels to make sure he kept everyone in line. Now, that would require a level of coercion, a level of physical violence, or a level of the threat of physical violence. There are stories of him hanging women out from windows, uh, terribly violent, to the point where it became an embarrassment to Lenny McPherson. Lenny would have to go around and pay these girls off, pay their medical expenses. He was a brutal, vicious man who shot first and didn't bother asking questions at all, and yet he was married for 50-odd years, so there was a contrast there, and in many ways was a loving family man. But if you weren't family, put on your bulletproof vest. As he matured, Smith's violence towards women eased off, perhaps because the violence in other areas of his life was providing the release he needed. In 1963, Smith was shot and nearly killed by rival extortionist Robert Pretty Boy Walker. It was his first serious brush with death. I suspect that would have been a significant moment in Stan's life. This is a dangerous game. Yes, I can make money. Yes, I'm, I can wear a fancy suit and a nice tie and a, and a hat. I can be someone. But if I get in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, I can get killed. So Stan's view of violence, I think, would have been significantly impacted from the experience he had of almost being killed by Walker. And you just knew revenge was going to come, and it would come uh, with, with, with fire and brimstone. Smith was shot just before Lenny McPherson's wedding, where he was due to be the best man. Determined not to let McPherson down, Smith checked himself out of hospital as the wedding provided more than just a chance to celebrate. It offered the perfect alibi. Back before the speech, it's a promise. Ben? Yeah. Of course, dear. I understand. Have fun. And stay safe. Yeah. McPherson kindly took the time out after he was married that day and before going to the reception to shoot Walker. Hey, wait up. Is that him? Well, look at that. Looks like we're doing this on the street. Hello, pretty boy. You forget to RSVP my wedding. After eight years by his side, Smith was no longer McPherson's protege, but his indispensable right-hand man, a partner McPherson would kill for and defend to the death. And with a perfect alibi, the murder remained unsolved. He makes a statement, a statement that is transmitted to everyone. Everyone who thinks that you can get the stand, this is what happens. It was violent, it was intense, it was public, and it was simply a full stop at the end of a sentence. This is what happens if you come after me. They stuck together. They made it known that if you went for any one of them, you'd better take the three of them out because the other two would get you very quick. And that was a very strong, very 
uh, significant message that was sent and certainly deterred people. There weren't too many that had the confidence they could take three out before they were killed. In the swinging 60s, Sydney was full of rich pickings for enterprising crims, and Stan the Man, together with brother-in-arms, Lenny McPherson and George Freeman, was running rackets all over the city. Although they were gangsters through and through, the team adhered to a very old-fashioned code. What was quite interesting with these Balmain boys who did it tough is that they never saw themselves as committing crimes against the general public or citizens of Balmain or anything like that. It was almost like a class war. We don't hurt the poor people, it's we only steal from the rich. With, with the team, it was only if you interfered with, with their business practices or with them personally that you had something to worry about. You had nothing to worry about if, if you had nothing to do with them. During that era, the criminals had no compunction about attacking each other. They would do terrible things to each other. There was no holds barred in dealing with each other. But as far as the squareheads and most of all children was concerned, they were total no-go areas. It may have been a decade of peace and love, but Sydney's underworld was untouched by flower power, with vicious turf wars erupting as the team took over. Rivals were warned off, brutally beaten or gunned down in cold blood. Stan Smith was a very effective executioner. Uh, he'd, he'd done it for business reasons all his life, to protect the businesses that they had been involved with the East Coast milieu. He was probably responsible for anywhere between 15 and 25 shootings, which would place him at test match level so far as a professional killer was concerned. Stan was linked to many murders over the years, with victims including standover man Charlie Burke, gambler Jackie Steele and crime boss Richard Riley. Despite all these deaths, ambitious criminals kept trying to challenge the team's dominance. In the early 70s, they had another problem on their hands, Stuart John Regan. Regan was a dangerous man, dubbed the magician, as people who crossed his path had a habit of vanishing. Stuart John Regan was one of the most feared standover men in Sydney during the 1960s and early 1970s for one very simple reason. He had a hair trigger temper. He immediately resorted to violence, a, a sort of violence that you couldn't predict. Well, the team, they did live by a code. Um, I mean, innocent people had nothing really to fear. Uh, whereas with, with John Regan, Innocent people had a lot to fear. If he was in, in, in your vicinity, you had a lot to fear. He killed his peers, he killed his rivals, he killed anyone and hurt anyone who got in his way. He became a threat to the very system that Freeman, McPherson and Stan depended on for their livelihood. Regan's blatant disregard for the established order made him enemies everywhere. But what finally sealed his fate was a murder that outraged even hardened criminals. Asked to babysit a friend's young son, Regan murdered the child. His body has never been found. When the baby went missing, um, Regan was clearly the suspect. His violence was well known. There's no doubt he killed the baby. It received a lot of adverse publicity in the media. And from the point of view of Freeman, McPherson, Smith, they were trying to run an operation at that time that was quiet, discreet, out of the way. They were more interested in the money than the publicity. Regan had to go, and his murder was arranged. By this point, Smith was a seasoned killer and a father himself, and he would have had no hesitation in dealing with a man who murdered a child. Smith and Freeman, together with veteran crime lord Paddles Anderson, devised a plot to lure the magician to his death. I've had a fucking gutful of brick. He's dead, he's fucking dead. You got any ideas? Well, it won't be easy. He's as paranoid as all shit. Always carrying. Not a worry. Look at him at his weak point. Oh, what do you think that might be, Stanley? He wants to be one of us. Go on. We'll tell him there's an opening in the business. Tell him we're gonna hook him up. Where? Your game. SP would be a good place to start. Well, he's been sniffing around it long enough. Smells good to me. So we set up a meeting where we're going to lay it all out. The master's apprentice. And you blow his fucking brains out. 
Don't get fucked. I'm not doing this on my own. No, no, I'll do the hard work. You just bail him up, give me the nod, and then pop, pop. Hey, presto. I'm all magician. George, mate. Hello, Johnny. You're going to show me the ropes at last. Well, you know, you've been pestering me long enough. I reckon you deserve it. Ain't that the truth? First thing I need to do is introduce you to Stan. Who? Hello, Johnny. No! You were next, George. He went beyond the pale when he took it upon himself to murder a boy. So you can imagine how this is viewed. They're crooks, they're not monsters. You know, they, they view family in the same way as we do. So a bloke who could kill a kid, he could kill anyone. He had no standards, no scruples, nothing whatsoever. The rumour has always been that Stan Smith was involved. Um, good on him, as I said before, I, he should have got a medal. Oh, well, I, I, I'm, now that I'm out of the place, I, I can say things like this. I think they did a community service in getting rid of some of those people. Um, now, if you're a serving police officer, you should never say that, but I can assure you that a lot of police held that view. The team had taken the law into their own hands, upholding the unwritten code which governed Sydney's underworld. As Regan bled to death, Stan the Man was also sending out another message. People like Regan would not be tolerated. Here's a bloke, completely overstepped the mark. The police can't charge him, they, they can't get evidence. We've taken over and we've decided to make an example of this bloke. Hello, Johnny. No! There were a number of similarities, of course, between the murder of John Regan and Chris Flannery. And in particular, I'd point to the fact that both were carried out almost as a civic duty. No, no, I'll do the hard work. You just bail him up, give me the nod, and then pop, pop. Hey, presto, I'm all magician. It's not always endorsed that the, the, the criminals should take care of the justice system, but surprisingly, the death of Regan was, uh, was celebrated as, uh, as a triumph for the criminal gangs. They had taken care of their own problem. Regan's is a statement of execution. Regan's is a way of saying, this person is no longer part of our fraternity. This person threatens the very livelihood that we, that we thrive on. So Regan really is about removing a threat, a danger. Stan Smith's ruthlessness as an enforcer and assassin had ensured the team's position as godfathers of Sydney's underworld. But his ambitions didn't stop there. Smith and fellow gang member Lenny McPherson made contact with the American Mafia, hoping to expand their empire overseas. In Chicago, the Australian gangsters were an immediate hit with Mafia boss Joe Teston. They were given the royal treatment. They flew to Chicago. There was Tester's limousine um, waiting at the airport. They were driven out to this palatial house. It was full of airline uh, hostesses and so forth. And, and, uh, and it was just like Disneyland for these Aussies. And they spent weeks there, literally. The one night, there was a big, um, a big uh, party there. And a rival of Tester's arrived on the scene. And it started to get ugly. Uh, and to the point where this rival punched Joe. Stan Smith launched himself at this guy and bit his nose off and spat it out in the ground. And Tester just could not believe, you know, this, this was not even his fight. This was protecting Joe. Therefore, Joe could trust these people. And this started a long-term relationship between them. Smith used the trip to learn everything he could about the Mafia's money-making operations and invited Tester and his men back for a return visit. The Americans assumed Sydney would be an easy territory to take over, but seeing the team in action made them think again. They looked at the style of McPherson, they looked at the style of Smith, they knew that they were violent, bestial men when it suited them, who, uh, who would not hesitate to shoot any intruders, whether they were Mafia aligned or not. And the Mafia gently declined and returned to America, thinking it wasn't really worth it which gives you some idea of the quality of brutality that existed in Australian crime at the time. 
But Smith's ambitions didn't stop at the Mafia. Spotting a gap in the market, Smith turned his entrepreneurial criminal mind to the most lucrative market of all, drugs. It was a controversial move. You had a real division uh, in the crooks in those days, that uh, those that regarded drugs as, as an as a evil business that was killing people and so forth, and those that saw that, well, there was heroin and then there was marijuana. And marijuana was regarded as a soft drug. It, it wasn't killing people. They'd smoked it themselves, and, and they, they, they rather liked it. Stan's view was that, that the market for cannabis was acceptable. Certainly by, by the 70s and 80s, it was the university, the, the, the young movement that were using cannabis. It was used recreationally. It was kind of accepted in, in entertainment circles. So cannabis was a tolerable drug. Always the strategist, Smith was keen to get a slice of the vast amounts of cash to be made dealing drugs. And he wanted fellow gang members, Lenny McPherson and George Freeman, to join him. This is the future, boys. If we don't get into this, we're gone. Yesterday's heroes. There's no future in drugs, Stan. The shortcut to the morgue, the customers and us. Come on, George, keep up. The 80s are just around the corner. We need to rethink things. You blokes are still stuck in the 60s. Stan, listen to me, son. You think we haven't thought of this before? Studied all the angles? Then why haven't you done anything about it? Because I'm not fucking interested. Every day we stay out of this, another bloody wog is lying in his pockets with what is rightfully ours. Drugs are fucking dumb, Stan. <sighs> Gambling girls and grog don't kill the punters. I'm not talking junk. Sticking needles in your arms a mugs game. I'm talking smoke. That's all the same thing, Stan. No, it's not. It's never killed anyone. It's pure fun, Lenny. And nearly every kid under the age of 30 in this country smokes it nearly every day. Stan. No, 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 wait. Pot sells itself. We can get as much as we want. It's cheap, and they're not scared of it. Where from? You remember Lloydie? Lloyd Moynihan? <laughs> the fucking bongo player. Yeah, the fucking bongo player. Squillionaire. Lives in the Philippines. They gave him a whole island to grow pot on. Loads it into yachts, and delivers it here. Sorry, Stan, it's not for me. I'm crying out fucking loud! I'm not gonna stand here and just watch this pass us by. Listen, Stan, we've got a lot of people supporting us. The Parliament, the police. If they hear we're in the drugs, they'll fucking run them off. It's not drugs, George! Well, I think if you ask the police and the coppers, they'll say that it is. What do you want me to do? I'm not walking away. You start dealing drugs, you'll be walking away from us. George, take it easy. I see no reason why young Stanley here can't run his drugs on his own and still work for us. I'll tell you what, you start dealing drugs, you can take my phone number out of your little black book. <sighs> Freeman and McPherson made a very conscious decision in those early 70s not to get involved in the drug trade uh, or even the cannabis trade because they saw it as creating problems. They didn't believe the police would accept it and they didn't believe the politicians would accept it. A lot of their political contacts uh, would leave them for dead uh, if it was discovered that they were involved in drugs. But Stan Smith was a risk taker and he also understood that there were incredible profits to be made. McPherson didn't want a bar of it, Freeman didn't want a bar of it, but Smith went on his merry way. The more Smith became involved in the sale and distribution of cannabis, the less he saw of McPherson and Freeman, but no one should be any, in any doubt if he was ever called upon by them to assist, he went to their aid, the same as they would go to his. It was their survival. I mean, he wanted to have uh, as much power, wealth and sense of domination of others that he could. He could see that drugs was going to offer him an immense empire that he could uh, control and that probably made him feel even more powerful. Branching out on his own, Smith used his network of international contacts to get involved in the drug trade, working with disgraced British peer Lord Moynihan to import marijuana. He was a peer of the realm. He'd run up a string of um, bad checks in England and had fled. In the 1950s, he'd arrived in Australia and became a bongo player and was well known around the King's Cross area. Having got into trouble here, he returned to England and 
went through Karachi and married a belly dancer and all that, then ended up back in the Philippines. He was a very heavily protected man. He was given land for next to nothing and basically the labour in which to grow the marijuana. The marijuana would be shipped out of the Philippines without too much fuss because the Marcos officials were all on side. They got $12 million or perhaps $20 million worth of, uh, worth of credit. They got 12 tonnes of marijuana and they got a yacht. This was the sort of um, usefulness that Stan Smith could provide with his contacts. Stan Smith was routinely receiving shipments of five tonnes of marijuana every couple of months. He became the biggest distributor of marijuana Australia had at the time. Smith was heavily involved in the drugs trade for many years, but he played the game well and stayed out of the limelight. Well connected, he was arrested just twice in his whole career and served just three months behind bars in his entire adult life. Stan Smith was a product of the corruption of New South Wales. He had a system there where uh, the East Coast milieu, as it was known, established themselves with the aid of corrupt police in New South Wales to the point where they were completely untouchable. Well, you've got to look at his influence. I mean, Freeman and everybody else would be very impressed by the fact that he can walk off a plane in Melbourne with uh, hashish and it takes eight years to get to trial. They could do whatever they wanted, they could pay off whoever they needed to pay off, and murder, extortion, drugs, you name it, was all covered up. And Stan was a functionary of that system. Through the 70s, Smith's drug dealing empire raked in a fortune. But he was a drug dealer with a secret. His eldest son was fighting a losing battle with heroin addiction. To make matters worse, Stan the man was summoned to testify before a royal commission investigating drug trafficking. The man who had lived his life in the shadows was suddenly in the spotlight. Although he survived without any legal repercussions, the dent to this seasoned killer's pride would have been substantial. His son became addicted to heroin, probably using the same kind of contacts that Stan had in his own drug dealings. When Stan Sr. gave evidence to the Woodward Commission, he said, I'm not involved in drugs because my own son is currently serving a sentence in jail for drug-related offences. We tried to rehabilitate him, it wasn't working. It may be that Stan Jr. was doing a jail term because it was the last option to getting him off the gear. Smith stood there tearfully and explained to the, uh, the Commission that he would never ever be involved in, uh, in drugs because his own son was, um, was a, uh, what he called a hopeless heroin addict and uh, tears ran down his cheeks as he explained to everybody exactly how committed his son was. Smith had taken um, very substantial steps to try and get his son off heroin. He put him into rehabilitation. In fact, he'd built what I guess you or I might describe at their Wild Beach home as a jail cell to try and keep control of his son and get him off the heroin. Over the years, Smith had steadfastly refused to deal heroin. Tragically, despite his best efforts, his son died of an overdose shortly after being released from prison. The news hit the family hard. Smith, the drug dealing kingpin, had lost his eldest son to the scourge of drug addiction. Revenge would be swift and brutal. Well, there's a few of us going away for the weekend and we're gonna need a fair bit. I don't know, maybe five grams. I'll take it. Gonna pick it up tonight? Cash? You got the horse? Money's in the car. Get it. Oh! <sighs> 
fucking mad. This was a seminal event in Stan Smith's life. In some ways, he felt that this uh, disaster that befell his son was his fault. This was some sort of atonement from a higher power for what he'd done. Um, th that, that wouldn't mean that he'd, he'd be above taking his own revenge against the drug dealer who he believed had sold his son the gear. There was no gun used and it wasn't quick. There was a lot of pain inflicted. The savagery with which this murder was carried out. The, the, the guy was run over repeatedly, reversed over, run over. And, and this was more than just a clinical contract killing. This was a punishment. The reports at the time were made it very obvious that it was a very personal killing. It was more than a professional hit. Going to pick it up tonight? Stan had been involved in numerous murders, various acts of violence, but to lose one of your own brings it home. I think it was, it was the start of a big change in his life. Psychologists believe Stan Smith would have been overwhelmed by his grief and rage. When Stan Jr. died of an overdose, he would have gone after the person who supplied him the drug because that would be the natural place for his rage, his anger, his disappointment, his grief, his loss to be targeted. And I don't think he's so much sending a message to the community, he's simply looking for retribution. There's nothing about this crime that's designed to do anything else except in some ways exculpate his own sense of grief and loss. And so it's, it's not a business uh, transaction. It's a very human transaction about wanting to cause someone else to feel the same degree of pain that he's feeling. It was through um, you know, a white hot rage where by getting in the car and running this guy over and over and over again, um, it, he, it was sort of like a symbolic release of his own pain as well as doing the deed that he needed to do. A son dared a heroin, something that doesn't go away. It lives with you for a long time. Maybe he thought he was paying back, helping people like his son. After the death of his eldest son from a heroin overdose, Smith stepped back into the shadows to mourn his loss. Despite the family's tragedy, he continued to run his marijuana distribution ring, racking up a fortune estimated at between 20 and 30 million dollars. The team dominated Sydney's underworld until they were finally finished off by death and old age. Smith's partner in crime, George Freeman, died of an asthma attack in 1990, and his lifelong friend and mentor, Lenny McPherson, died in prison in 1996. When you look at the lives of McPherson, Freeman and Smith, of all of them, Smith was the one who was able for almost 30 years to operate successfully and at the same time maintain a very low profile that kept him out of the public view. He very much was this person who was successful in applying Lenny's mantra of, you can't go around shooting people in the streets, it's bad for business. Stan Smith, uh, I would rate as uh, in my own view, certainly the smartest criminal in my time in the police service, without shadow of a doubt, and a very, very significant player. With his lifelong friends gone and his eldest son dead of an overdose, Smith's thoughts turned to his own mortality. In the end, he became a philosopher in life. He, uh, he, he sort of read up on philosophy and uh, uh, I'd see him at the coroner's court at the Flannery inquest and he would be philosophising about things and I thought, this can't be the Stan Smith that I know from years ago. He's completely changed. There is no doubt that over the years, Smith was very affected by his son's 
death as a result of heroin, and perhaps even this general realisation of your own mortality once you start getting into the 60s and 70s particularly. The extraordinary journey of Smith's life had one more twist to take. In 2003, he found God. As seen in this exclusive footage, Smith was baptised into the Evangel Bible Church and became born again. Good morning to everybody. My name is Stanley Smith. I'm 67 years old. I started my religious study when I was seven years old. In if you thought that uh, selling refrigerators to Eskimos was the ultimate challenge, a man called Beaver did something even more difficult. He converted Stan Smith to religion. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised in newness of life. How he got close enough to even broach the subject, we'll never know, but he did. And in his latter years, Stan Smith, the, the tough man involved with so many murders and so much crime, turned to God. In fact, when his former colleagues would come along to uh, seek advice about more criminal activities, Stan was more likely to talk to them about Jesus and the path to redemption. Even St Paul didn't go along a road to redemption as dramatic as that. Given his lifelong involvement in murder and violence, Smith's associates found his sudden conversion hard to believe. So we've got our union people in there. Once the concrete's poured, they walk off. The old building rot. You seem to have it pretty well covered. We know. So what are we doing here? What do you want from me? <laughs> we want you on board. That's not my go. I haven't been on a building site for 20 years or more. No, we don't want you to leave your front door. We just want your name attached. Stan Smith. You're the brand. Now, once the contractors know we've got you behind us, they'll be breaking their arms, reaching for their checkbooks. What am I? Pepsi? You guys want to do business. You go right ahead. Well, can we uh, drop your name in? Tell you what I can give you. Anything, Stan. You know what Jesus did in the temple? Sorry? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Jesus punted all the moneylenders from the temple. He didn't need a brand. He was doing God's work. Yeah, right. Jesus. Praise Jesus. Of course. Look, I'm going to give you guys the best thing any man can give you. I'm going to pray to Jesus for you. Give me your hands. That's the way. Look, I believe that it was a genuine conversion. I think it was a way of him saying, the past has passed. Um, I'm now a different person to what I used to be. The conversion wasn't a jail conversion. This wasn't an attempt to, to demonstrate remorse to a court. This was, I believe, a genuine metamorphosis from someone who'd been an angry, violent man into someone who started to reflect upon his life's value. Well, there's a story that he found God uh, and I, I, I don't believe it. The simple reason, if he did, he would have put his hand up and given himself up for all the people he'd knocked off. And he certainly didn't do that, so I think God's out the door. Mark Chopper Reed also had doubts that a man with such a violent past could undergo such a radical transformation. You know, like, I'm not going to name him, but um, some. Some of the w wombats that I found, God in jail. God Almighty, you wouldn't, you wouldn't wear them on a brooch, you know. Would you care to have a word of prayer with me, brother? What? What? They come to you in the showers and say, would you care to have a word of prayer with me? Not, not right at the moment, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> he died in January 2010, 
And for over six years, he got involved in the religious bit. Even charities up at King's Cross Silveri, he was giving handouts to some of the derelicts and whatnot. But I'm just not sure what to make, whether it's fair dinkum or not. I think most criminals would be laughing and saying, oh, yeah, try and pull the other one. And, I mean, just logically, it's almost incomprehensible to imagine that you drop your, you know, 60 years of criminal conduct or 50 years of criminal conduct and then find a new sense of self. I mean, this is a guy who's shown that he has transitions as he goes through life. It could be that. It could be the uh, waking up one day and not being able to stop the voice in his head about what happened to his son. And the important thing, though, is that there's no remorse because he doesn't do anything to make good the harm that he's done. Smith died on January the 13th, 2010, and his funeral was an odd mix of born-again Christians and hardened gangsters. He'd lived a life of contradictions, a drug dealer whose son had died of an overdose, a killer turned born-again Christian. Smith may have believed that his soul would be saved and his sins would be forgiven. But one thing is clear, with all that blood on his hands, he would have needed a very forgiving God.